I want to ask um, first off about your recent book um, that talks about uh, narratives that drive markets. And this trade story seems to be the dominant narrative in these markets. What do right. you think about it? Yeah, a narrative is, a, I'll talk about economic narratives that have an effect on economic activities. The trade war narrative, uh, it isn't eternal, but it goes back all the way to the Great Depression. And people, uh, there was a trade war in the Great Depression in the 1930s. And it was widely thought then that it was the cause of the depression. And that was an economic narrative because people became conservative in their beha economic behavior out of fear of this trade war. And the same thing can happen right now again, I think. Uh, uh, good morning. Good morning, Good morning to you, uh, Robert. We'll talk a little bit more about your book. I wanted to, I wanted to dwell on the, uh, the state of the U.S. and global economy uh, in, in, in this conversation a little bit, and we will get to the, the details of your, of your really fascinating book about narrative economics. In terms of the damage that the trade war is doing to the U.S. economy, what's the lens that you uh, would use to, to, to answer that? How would you assess that damage at the moment? Well, I think that recessions are substantially often caused by fear of a repeat of the, some previous recession. Uh, and so this uh, has awakened us to fear. Now, it wasn't a trade war in the 10 year ago re worldwide recession, but we still have memories of that. And so it has launched a, uh, a narrative that has brought along with it other narratives. So for example, the inverted yield curve story uh, has much stronger than it's ever been before. So you have people thinking that it's been scientifically proven that we'll have a recession soon. And that causes them to, maybe it hasn't yet, but it will eventually, if it's reconfirmed, cause them to cut back on their spending or cut back on hiring or new investment. Right, and this goes back to animal spirits, really. Bob, I, I wonder what you think of the recent commentary out of um, some Fed speakers regarding the U.S. consumer in that case. I mean. Um, the narrative out of uh, around the U.S. economy seems to be that although there are a lot of headwinds from the global economy, the consumer is still yeah. carrying the weight, um, keeping the U.S. back yeah. from a recession. And the concern is that if they don't act soon, at least this is, I think Bob Kaplan recently said something to this effect, um, it'll be too late for the consumer and uh, he'll drop the bag. What do you think about that? Well, the, uh, there's a deep question of what drives consumers. It's been consumer confidence is what we talk about. But I think there's other fact, other narrative. Cons consumer confidence is, is a barometer, I suppose, but it doesn't describe the narrative. And there have been narratives that have been growing over the years that encourage consumption. So it's partly, in, in America particularly, uh, the so-called American dream uh, has been growing through time. That is an old phrase, but it refers to an outlook that it's okay to show off your wealth. In fact, you better do it. That's the American way. We're a capitalist country. We stand for capitalism. So the other thing is that who's piled onto this narrative is Donald Trump, our, our president, who has been writing books uh, to explain how to live your life. So one of his books was called Think Like a Billionaire. Uh, so we've got millions of Americans trying to learn how to think like a billionaire. And that, that certainly means acting like you're not impoverished. So people spend money, they feel it's the times. <laughs> now that could change, it could, it could last, for, I don't know how to predict these things accurately. It could last for a long time, but I suspect it might be changing with the story of the worldwide recession that supposedly coming. Mm. Yes, interesting, and I, and I know in your book you dwell on that, the battle between frugality and conspicuous consumption and which right. one wins out. Um, I want to ask you, Robert, as we've got you here about the housing market in the U.S., um, of course the Case-Shiller Index, uh, very topical uh, g given the conversation with you and you, you l lending your name to it um, uh, and, 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 and its creation. Are we due a pullback, do you think, in house prices given what we see on that Case-Shiller Index at the moment? That's uh, a good question. Uh, normally, the housing market is much more forecastable than our stock markets. It's very different. The stock market is approximately a random walk, but the housing market is not at all a random walk. It's very smooth through time. 
momentum is a much stronger factor in the housing market. So we've seen a, 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 the bottom of our market since the financial crisis was 2012. And at first, when the market went up, it was stunning. There was over 10% a year appreciation. But it's been gradually declining. And now it's more like 3%. Uh, in real terms, corrected for inflation, it's getting close to zero. Uh, so normally, you can extrapolate this. And it would suggest declining home prices in the near future. But I think it's a little bit hard to really forecast at this present time. The, the nation is going through a polarization crisis, much like in Britain. And it's uh, where we go, I, I can't. I wouldn't be at all surprised if home prices started falling in the, uh, and it could be accompanied by a recession.